This presentation of the Easter Messiah Festival by KPTS has been made possible through major underwriting from Aid Association for Lutherans, headquartered in Appleton, Wisconsin. Additional underwriting provided by the Dane G. Hansen Foundation, the Meyer Family, Nelson Trust, the Elmer C. Roden Charitable Trust, and F.C. Thompson. America's Heartland, a mighty choir of 400 joins together to culminate a unique cultural event. This is the Eastern Messiah Festival. It was on March 28, 1882, that the Messiah was first performed here in Lindsburg, Kansas. Hello. I'm Jim Lewis, and welcome to Lindsburg and to the Easter Messiah Festival. On that day in 1882, a small choir and orchestra joined together here in Bethany Lutheran Church to perform a piece of music few of them had ever heard before, Handel's great oratorio, The Messiah. Many of the choir members had walked miles from their sod homes on the prairie to sing in the choir. They were Swedish immigrants struggling to make a living in a harsh new land. Dr. Carl Svensson, pastor of the church, had brought them together. Dr. Svensson had hoped that an annual performance of the Messiah during Easter would serve two purposes. First, it would help to raise the spirits of the immigrants throughout the area. And second, the performance could raise funds to build a new school in Lindsburg. That school became Bethany College, home to the Messiah Festival. Nestled in the Smoky Hill River Valley of central Kansas, the Swedish community of Lindsberg is home to Bethany College, a small private institution. The heart of Bethany is an ambitious fine arts program centered around the Messiah Festival. It's been a very long historical experience here in this location. Uh, the type of artistic opportunities the uh, opportun that people have in coming here to experience music such as the the words and the tones that come from the Messiah, or the deep religious thoughts that are in the Messiah as well as pervade through the St. Matthew's Passion experience, I think cause people to just walk a foot or two above the ground for a little while, at least intellectually. <laughs> The founding father of art in Lindsberg was Berger Sanzane, a Swedish immigrant who came to Kansas in 1893 and began producing unique landscape paintings. Many of his works are displayed in the Berger Sanzane Memorial Gallery, largely the creation of his son-in-law, Dr. Pelham Greeno III. Sanzane liked color. You very rarely see a painting of his that's dull. He didn't like to do little paintings, he liked to do fairly large paintings but he liked to paint. And someone asked him what he would do if uh, he didn't paint. Well, he said he might just well not breathe. He, painting was his life. Mr. Sanzane always liked to show his work along with other people's work. He wanted to share the, uh, the exhibits and the exhibitions. So it has gone on as a tradition. So you see, we're sharing this building with six artists in this room. We're sharing it also in another room where we have Mr. Sanderson and also Bill Rutherford. We usually have this uh, west wall for Lester Raymer during Easter week. And Mr. Raymer is one of our oldest painters here in Lynchburg. And he, he was nationally known. Of course, he would attract others. We worked together on certain projects. And... Uh, what would we have if we didn't have the music and the arts? What would there be? Just business? <laughs> the visual arts are equally important to Bethany College. A major aspect of the Messiah Festival is an exhibit of student art. I believe it that a lot of people find Bethany, um, a slow enough pace 
that they can accomplish as much work as they need to accomplish, and they're supported by each other. Even though we're in the middle of the plains, I would put Bethany College, I mean, I would put it up against any other institution as far as the art that goes on in this art department. Because it's good, look at it. Festival week at Bethany is filled with music. Two oratorios, Messiah and the Bach St. Matthew Passion, and recitals by guest soloists. The size of the chorus is the thing that really got to me. Um, I sing with large amateur choruses a lot, you know, in New York and Philadelphia and Detroit and St. Louis, etc. But um, they usually average around 175, 200 voices. Wow, uh, 400 voices is really a knockout. soloist, Rebecca Copley, has literally grown up with the Messiah Festival. Her father, Dr. Elmer Copley, has conducted Messiah for over 20 years. I The best way to describe coming back to perform here, at home, on this stage, with these people, wonderful people singing behind you, listening to you out in the audience, is, is holding a dream come true in my hand. This is something that I have looked forward to with grandest hopes all my life, thinking that perhaps the day would come when I could be soprano solace for the festival. It's a wonderful place to sing, as far as this auditorium is concerned. Uh, you have a lot to work with. The singer doesn't have to work very hard at all because uh, of the acoustics in here. It really works with you. And so you are enabled um, the chance to create, to hopefully touch heartstrings of somebody in every row. In other words, uh, a recital can be so special because you can have many different aspects to it. And uh, with each production being a mini drama, Messiah Festival is the Easter Sunday performance of Messiah. Composed by George Frederick Handel in 1741, Messiah ranks as one of the world's most beloved musical works. Handel wanted to picture the whole life of Christ and through his prophecy, the prophecy of the birth of Christ, the birth itself, and his death 
his resurrection, and through his resurrection, the redemption of man, uh, and the gradual progress from beginning to end of man's achievement of perfection or heaven. Well, of course, I've heard the Messiah before, and I've listened to a tape the whole week ahead getting ready for it. It's going to be real exciting. Well, I'm anticipating a great performance. I understand that I'm just going to be overwhelmed when the chorus all starts to sing. We come back here usually every year. Sometimes we don't always attend the Messiah because we've heard it so many times, but we're usually here. I went to Bethany for a short time, and uh, so I'm familiar with the whole presentation. I just love the, the uh, Hallelujah Chorus. I, really, it really makes a finale for the for the uh, um, the Messiah itself, and you're just waiting for that grand finale. I've heard about it all my life. I grew up in Emporia, Kansas. I always wanted to come, and this is the year. It's Easter Sunday and the performance of Messiah is about ready to begin. Joining me for this special performance is Jim Lehrer, co-host of Public Television's McNeil Lehrer Report, and a native of Kansas. I was born in Wichita, and uh, when I was about 10 or 11 years old, I sang in a boys' choir, and on an Easter Sunday like this one, we got on a chartered bus and we came up here and we heard these marvelous people uh, uh, sing the Messiah. It left uh, memories that uh, I carry with me today and I'm looking forward to seeing it again 35 years later. Well, later in this program, we'll be taking a closer look at the people of this campus and community who have made the Messiah Festival such a rich and beautiful tradition, Jim. Right, one point that needs to be made about the music, the Messiah, most of us are familiar with part one. That's what it's called the prophecy and the narrative of the nativity. That's the part that's often sung at Christmas time, but there's much more to it than that. The oratorio uh, goes on and culminates in the resurrection, and that's the point of it all, in fact, and it's an Easter point, to be technical about it, more than it is a Christmas point. Indeed it is. Uh, I think we're just about ready to begin, Jim. We might go on into Presser Hall now and uh, take a look at what's going on. All right. The orchestra and the chorus are already on stage there in the hall. Conductor Elmer Copley and the soloist should be arriving shortly. It looks like we have a, an absolutely packed house today, Jim. Uh, approximately 2,000 people are here, uh, not only from the central Kansas area, but from south central Kansas, uh, all over the Great Plains and the Midwest itself. Today's performance will be in two parts with an intermission in between. The first section includes the prophecy and narrative of the nativity. And in a few moments now, the soloist here we go with the first two soloists, soprano Doralyn Davis and tenor Daniel Nelson. Now, mezzo-soprano Victoria Groff and baritone William Metcalf. Finally, the conductor, Elmer Copley. We'll first hear the orchestral overture to the Messiah by George Frederick Handel.
Straight. 
Lord, the Lord of hosts. Yet once a little while, and I will shake the hands and the earth, the sea and the dry land, and I will shake, and I will shake, all nations I'll shake. The hands, the earth, the sea, the dry land, all nations I'll shake, and the desire of all nations shall come. The Lord who we seek shall suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant will be delighted. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Stand 
finest fire, look at his finest fire, and who shall stand when he, when he appeareth, and who shall stand when he appeareth, for he is like a refinest fire, and who shall stand when he when he appeared, for he is like a refined fire, for he is like a refined fire.
Oh, oh. 
that walked in darkness, that walked in darkness. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light, have seen a great light, a great light.
The Easter Messiah Festival was acquired and broadcast through a grant from the Lutheran Coalition of Greater Dayton, representing 28 Lutheran churches serving the Greater Dayton area. Intermission time here in Lynchburg, Kansas, following part one of Handel's Messiah, the prophecy and the narrative of the Nativity, performed by the Bethany College Oratorio Society, directed by the conductor, Elmer Copley. Dr. Copley will be up here with Jim Lewis and me in a moment, and we'll talk to him a little bit. Jim, while we're waiting for uh, Dr. Copley, just uh, to follow up for a moment on uh, the fact that we touched on at the beginning of the program, that as a native of Wichita, Kansas, and a member of the Wichita Boys Choir, right. you attended uh, the Messiah Festival here sometime in the mid-40s. Uh, right. Does what you've seen and heard so far bring back to you any memories or images of that visit? Oh, it sure does, Jim. First of all, I have a much better seat today than I had 35 <laughs> years ago. I was sitting in the balcony, but way back over there. In fact, uh, we were sitting, there were about 20 of us in the choir, and we were sitting behind uh, two people doing just exactly what we're doing now, uh, only they were doing it on radio, oh, yes. done live in uh, Kansas for, for our Kansas City radio station. But, I mean, the memories, of, it's nice to know that I haven't gone completely senile because I remember this event 35 years ago as, as being something truly magnificent. And uh, being back here and watching it and hearing it today, I've seen it again. I must say, little things, for instance, which I had not noticed before, but as close as we have been to the to the chorus and you notice there are many of them holding you know the music to the messiah and uh, many of them are very old and yellowed and i understand yes. they hand these down the music itself they're handed down from from uh, person to person within the family father or mother to daughter son etc but i uh it's, uh, it's, it's just marvelous, and to think that uh, these people, with the exception of the four soloists who are professionals, who uh, two of them from New York City, one from Philadelphia, and one from Milwaukee, but with the exception of those four, everybody on this stage is from Lindsborg or the Lindsborg area, or students here at Bethany College. That's it's right. uh, remarkable. Jim, when you, were, when you came up here in the mid-40s, was it one of those things where you had to come up, it was good for you? Oh, sure, uh, sure, oh, was, exactly, yes, exactly. Yes. And we, uh, uh, the director of the boys' choir, fortunately for everybody concerned, we didn't sing up here, we just came <laughs> up and listened. But, uh, no, it was one of those things that everybody, we had to do it, and uh, we had, you know, picnic lunches, and we, we ate right outside on the chartered bus that was parked outside, and uh, uh, it was uh, it was wonderful. I remember having... Uh, fantasies at the time well one of these days you know I'd come back here and uh, and I, of course I was gonna be a soloist I, I was I was gonna I wasn't I hadn't cleaned it up as to whether I was gonna be a tenor or the baritone but I had all that in my mind but uh, things didn't work out but it's worked out for me to be back here I, I it's really really neat Jim has has Lindsborg uh, and the area as you remember it changed uh, considerably since you were here or not well it hasn't changed in terms of size I mean it was roughly 25 the population of Lindsborg was roughly 2500 then and it's 2500 now the Swedish influence I mean they call this little sweet in USA indeed they do and uh, it's still there in, and the, the downtown as we know of Sweden is the downtown of uh, Lindsborg is is, uh, it really looks like little Sweden, USA, with Swedish shops and Swedish restaurants and, and with uh, Swedish words all around. I mean, you can, uh, you can feel, having been to Sweden uh, myself, I can tell you that it looks like Sweden over there in downtown Lindsborg. Yeah. Dr. Copley uh, has joined us. Uh, yes, hello, Mr. Uh, Larry, nice to have you here. Uh, delighted to be here. Dr. Copley uh, is, in addition to being the director of uh, the, the Bethany College Oratorio Society, which sings the uh, Messiah. He is also a professor of music here at Bethany College, and this is your 20th year yes. Directing, uh, yes. directing the Messiah. Let me ask you something, Doctor. How do you get up to do the same thing for 20 years? Well, it looks like the same people, but it's not always the same people, so that helps. You have to recruit and start over because you have new singers every year, so that helps me get up. Mm -hmm. I think the main thing that gets me up is that uh, the text is something that is universal and is always new for us. In other words... Uh, is it still new for you? It's still new for me. There are new ways of doing things. I'm sure that I'm not doing some things today and didn't in the first part. That I, I'm sure I'm doing some things differently. A little other nuances of... Nuances. I, I study the text and I say, well, maybe it was meant to be done this way. 
And, uh, and so that gets me going. Um, uh, it gets me going to, well, you know, we facetiously we say we're going to do it till we get it right, but it gets me going to know there, you know. <laughs> After 100 years. <laughs> but you know, there are, but, yeah. but there are always things that you'd like to say, well, I'd like to do that a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And then because we're working with this, if we were doing, um, if we were doing Handel's Israel and Egypt, for instance, or Judas Maccabeus, I couldn't get up for it every year because of the text. I mean, that's a historical drama, exciting. but this, yeah, but this, yeah. but this has to do with the with the nuts and bolts of the Christian uh, religion, and that's what brings all these people all the time too. Do the uh, all of, we were just saying a moment ago that everybody on this stage, with the exception of the four soloists, are from this area, are from that's Bethany right. College. That's How right. do you maintain quality with? 400 people who are basically, 450 people who are basically amateurs. Well, number one, uh, the, the only restriction we have, aside from age, we have an age restriction. We don't let young people in until they turn 16 because we don't want to hurt their voices by singing too heavily. The only other restriction is that they're able to duplicate tones, and that helps a lot. You audition you know, them, in other words. We do, but it's, it's, uh, I have a woman on the faculty who helps me, Mrs. Dalston, another voice teacher helps me. And we just screen out the people who just can't carry a tune. I always say duplicate tones because it sounds more high flown, but we're just talking about the people who just simply can't follow. Then we have uh, a number of uh, musicians spotted throughout and they're, and they're well mixed, they're well integrated. And uh, then by rehearsing 10 weeks, we get them pretty well trained. Rehearse, well, you rehearse for 10 weeks. I mean, what kind of schedule? One we day rehearse, a week, three days a no, week? Or? Twice a week, we rehearse Sundays at three and Tuesdays at 7.30. And when we find out when East, well, actually, when Palm Sunday is, then we count back 10 weeks, and then if there's a spring break in there, we count back 11 weeks, then we know when we're supposed to start. We're usually starting about Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> That's about what it amounts to. Well, people who wouldn't know would think, my goodness, you look out at this group, and you see, you know, I know for a fact that there are people in this group who are farmers, who are bankers. I talked to a banker a That's few moments right. ago That's before right. we started. School teachers. School teachers. Shopkeepers. Uh, kids in high school right. and, and whatever. And to and they're not trained musicians. I no, think. they're not. But there are trained musicians in there. We also have music teachers in there. We have music major college students in there. We have music teachers from other communities come in. So there are some. It's not as though we don't have any. Yeah. You know? Elmer, it doesn't this seem to you, it does to me anyway, uh, a throwback to an earlier musical tradition almost where ordinary people got together to make music oh, and absolutely, enjoy. Absolutely. In fact, we have talked about that in rehearsal. Our, our, uh, our compensation comes at the end of each rehearsal. It really does. I've also used the term anachronism connected with it because, you know, when this started, that was it. That was the high point of their week was to get together with other people and sing. And I was telling someone yesterday, there's also something about uh, these people coming from a church choir of 15 or 10 or 25, and, and they can get something a little bit wider in scope and a little bit more perfected by getting that kind of experience too. And I think basically what, what needs to be said is that they're all such wonderful people. Uh, you know, you, I saw a sign one time that says, it's hard to soar like eagles when you work with turkeys and I never have to worry about yeah. that see because I work with eagles well, they're just such terrific people we're all wonderful people Dr. Copley what makes these people particularly wonderful well they no I won't say they're particularly wonderful I would say no I wouldn't say that I think this could be done in a lot of other places at this point but but it was started here, and there have been an awful lot of people over the years that have worked hard to make sure that it doesn't stop going. Well, when you started 20 years ago, did you, when the first time you stood down there on that podium, did you think, I have a tradition of then 80 years to maintain? Or did you say, okay, I'm Elmer Copley, I have my own, I, I come at this from my own professional vantage point, and maybe, maybe we can do it a little differently. Maybe we can interpret it a little differently. Exactly. In fact, when I came... Second or first? The second. Second. Okay. Because, I, be, because, you see, when I came, I, I had been told ahead of time of some of the traditions, and some traditions or elements of tradition can be rut, mm -hmm. you see? And, an example. And, or we would do a tempo differently, say so we've never done it that way. Or uh, there was a tradition here at one time that the longer you sang in the chorus, the farther towards the front that you sat as a place of honor. Well, then the people who are new are sitting in the back rows and could never hear or learn. So we mix them all up, but we've never done it that way, you see. Uh, I was the one that started having the college choir sing that little part of the Foreign Dorset Child is Born to get the big contrast 
with one the of ones the right up in the middle, right up there in the middle. The That's left, yeah, my college choir, that. and 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 that was to that was to emphasize even more the wonderful counselor that we come in the full chorus. But I really heard from a few people who 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 think tradition means rock bound, you can't change anything. But I have to tell you, what, just because you asked that question, but it was a beginning for me too. I had never had full charge of anything like this. And it was a good feeling for me after the first rehearsal to sort of step down and say, well, Copley, that's something you can do. Well, Dr. Copley, good luck on the next 20 years. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. And, and particularly the next half, but right. more, more particularly the, the next 20 years. Thank you. Well, let's take now a more extended look at this event, the town, the college, and the people who are behind it. The reporter is the producer of the piece, Terry Lacona. Such a great, beautiful, artistic production that once you are swept into it, you just absolutely are bowled over and you are a part of it. When we sing the Amen Chorus, I just, I get chills up and down my spine and my, and tingles up my arms and then I'll probably be crying by the end of the song because it, it's just, it's, it's just really a religious experience. Oh, it gets in your blood like anything else, motorcycle racing, you know, or flying kites or airplanes, you know, it gets in your blood and, and, uh, it's, it's fun, yeah, it's an unpaid group, you know, and that's the best group there is. I don't think that you'll find that kind of experience any other place where you join with 400 other voices and an orchestra and a very exciting and meaningful and inspiring presentation of something that is so beautiful that it can inspire many other people. Alba Mom Omquist, Alberta Sundstrom, Al Mogensen, and Edie Dalston have at least one thing in common. They, like thousands of others down through the past 100 years, have shared the experience of singing in the Messiah Chorus at Bethany College. It's an experience that perhaps has no equal on the American rural landscape. A cultural event for young and old, farmers, businessmen, housewives, college students. It's kind of a tradition, too, and there's a lot of pride going to Bethany because people associate the Messiah with Bethany, and you say, oh, I'm a student of Bethany College. And say, oh, yeah, I know a lot. So for a lot of outsiders, that might be the only thing they know about Bethany College is mm -hmm. the Messiah Festival every Easter. Mm -hmm. When you're a very small town in Kansas, you have to have something to associate yourself with. And for Lindsburg and for the Bethany area, it's, it's the Messiah. I always noticed when I was singing up there, when the crowd stood up for the Hallelujah Chorus, it was almost like they were standing up for Lindsberg, too. Mm -hmm. It's a real pride. That's one thing. I'm not singing in it and just watching it. It's, you just feel this real connection with the college. It's just like, this is me. This is a part of my Bethany that you can't deny. Tradition is an important part of life in Lindsberg, Kansas, located just a few miles from the precise geographic center of the United States. From its well-preserved cobblestone streets downtown, where the 10 o'clock and 3 o'clock coffee breaks are a social custom which rival the Messiah Festival itself, to the quiet, modern campus at Bethany, tradition lurks everywhere. Lindsberg was settled in 1869 by a band of Swedish immigrants, and it doesn't take a sharp eye or ear to realize that after four generations, that Swedish heritage is as strong as ever. At coffee break time, you'll still hear some of the mother tongue spoken at the back table in the Scandinavian bakery. There are Swedish restaurants, stores specializing in Swedish imports, lots of examples of Swedish-style architecture, even a Swedish-American insurance company. The Swedish pavilion at the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis was even moved here, lock, stock, and barrel. Probably the most popular symbol of Swedish culture in Lindsberg today is the Dalla horse. In fact, the people of Lindsberg have a love affair with this tiny red tailless horse, don't make the mistake of calling it a pony, whose origins go back centuries when it was regarded as a pagan idol by early Vikings. Today it can...
there is nothing contrived or superficial about that heritage and lifestyle of the people of Lindsberg that make them rather unique. I think it's an amalgamation of different things. Uh, Bethany College, of course, perhaps the most important of those. The Swedish heritage, the uh, Swedish culture that is here, the interest in music and art, uh, and of course our population. Of, uh, this community is, is uniquely a caring community. They're very sensitive about the feelings of others. The town-gown relationship is quite different, uh, it strikes me. There's not the resentment, the hostility, or the uh, apathy between the campus community and the people that live here in town. No, it's not here. Part of that uh, is because they have really matured together. The uh, founding fathers of the community were also the same founding fathers of the college, and they have grown up integrated one with the other there. Uh, on our police force, they're on our uh, city council, they're involved in our ambulance corps. It's a, it's an, there's almost a, it's almost impossible to divide the two. But a little over a decade ago, the two almost were torn apart. Bethany College was failing so fast and was so far in debt that some officials wanted to close the door and move to Denver. Along with the support of the Lutheran Church, the man most credited with reversing that trend by raising millions of dollars and boosting enrollment and morale is Bethany's president since 1967, Dr. Arvin Hahn. It's doubtful whether either the college or the community could live as well as they live as separate entities. But there are other things that are even deeper. Uh, they include uh, basic philosophical and ideological sameness. These are Christian people in the main who live in the Lindsberg community and people who want their youth and the people in a broader area to have this kind of experience and they contribute to have it happen. It was that same spirit a hundred years ago that inspired Carl Aaron Swenson, who in turn inspired those transplanted Swedes to build an institution of higher learning on the barren plains of the Midwest. Dr. Emery Lindquist is himself a former president of Bethany and a noted historian of the area. He was able to inspire the people to uh, participate in these things, to share what modest material means they had. We even have records where at times they mortgaged their farms in order to meet the obligations of the college. In more ways than one, Lindsberg in the 1980s is considered a cultural oasis on the plains. It's an artist community in which creative people interact daily. There's an exceptional number of galleries and studios for a population of only 3,000. The Berger Sanzam Memorial Gallery honors a man who lived three lives in one as a painter, teacher, and crusader for art, and often displays an amazing array of arts and crafts native to Lindsberg. Alba Ma Malmquist and her husband Ed are perfect examples of the artistic tradition in Lindsberg that goes back several generations. Both have been involved with painting and photography since the 1920s. Meanwhile, Bethany art professor Ray K. Meyer is creating with a quite different medium. Yet, despite the emphasis on art and culture, despite the influence of Bethany and the cosmopolitan nature of Lindsberg, there is no denying that farming is the lifeblood of the area. This is, after all, Kansas, and out here, that's synonymous with agriculture. Wheat is still the staff of life for Lindsberg and the Central Plains, and the spring crop is already planted. But here again, there's a difference. Forget your stereotypes of life on the farm. The ties that bind college and small town also reach out to the farm, where Larry and Edie Dalston have been raising wheat, pigs, and a family for over 10 years now. I think Lindsberg is a very special town to be near to and involved in. 
it affords our family many opportunities that we would not have in, in cities uh, or towns of the same size. We have opportunities for uh, an in-depth uh, music background. Um, the string program in the elementary school itself starts when you're in the fourth grade, you have an opportunity to do that. And then the instrumental band program begins in fifth grade and on up through high school. And of course, the example set by the college activities really leads for a lot of in-depth exposure at a very early age. Which brings us back full circle to the Messiah Festival. When you have a combination of a good cause, hearty belief in it, and pride in a good tradition, I think the future is assured. I have confidence that that will be the result here. I can remember back in, uh, in the 20s when we had a sign outside of town here that said that the popular, there were three signs. One was close your cutouts, and one was uh, Lindsberg's uh, water was 99 and 99 hundredths percent pure, and the uh, population was 2,500. And it hasn't, uh, there, there are just uh, probably a little over 3,000 here now. So it hasn't really grown all that much. It's maintained a lot of that small town feeling and, and charm. That it but it's still here. Yeah. It's still here. And not every small town in Kansas can say the same. So many of them are ghost towns. This is true. And uh, Lindsberg will always be here. It's a rich valley, and I'm sure the college will always be here. And uh, uh, Lindsberg is on the map to stay, I think. Lindsberg is indeed still here, and it is indeed a special town. Indeed it is, Jim. You know, nothing could uh, exemplify the community, even family nature of this festival, than the example of uh, trumpet soloist Professor Roger Thorstenberg and his family. Uh, he's participated in the festival for about 32 years. His mother was alto secretary. His wife has been in the festival for 34 years. Her sister played in the orchestra. And her father, Arvid Wallen, was the conductor of the festival in 1947 and 48. This is really a, a family uh, festival. It is. And now to the second half of Handel's Messiah, part two, Christ's Passion, Resurrection, part three, Man's Hope for His Resurrection. 